Quantity, quality, variety, and convenience. Their precise conceptual meanings can be explained and linked with one very simple equation that generates a scale that has the potential to be more accurate and important than anything currently in use. All of these fundamental concepts are inherently mathematical. Whether it's a higher quality TV like the Crystal LED, a more convenient DVR, or the variety of my five different Wagner ring sets, which is more than five copies of Carl Boehm's ring, even though it's my favorite. If you've never seen this notation before, then don't worry. Take the set of numbers 1, 2, and 3. 3 is the maximum, and 1 is the minimum. The definite integral of a function is just a number that can be compared with other numbers. You can take two functions, f and g, and define a third function, h, by taking the top parts of the two functions. Let's start with this analogous optimization problem. We have a fixed amount of time to maximize the amount of water in the tub. This faucet has a switch valve that is connected with these two pipes. If the water from one pipe goes in the tub, then the water from the other pipe gets wasted. Each pipe has a known flow function, f and g, which are both continuously differentiable. The optimizer compares the derivatives at each point in time and chooses the maximum. This rule produces a new function, z of t, which I call a zenith function. Each pipe's representation is a set of functions, one element in this case. So a set function creates a new function. Now let's add a third pipe maintaining the one pipe maximum constraint. The third pipe has a timing option, so the optimizer picks h1 of t or h2 of t. Suppose h1 of t is equal to g of t minus q for some q larger than zero, and h2 of t is equal to h1 of t plus s for some s not equal to zero. f of t will determine the relative value of pipes two and three. Our optimal rule set function has now created two zenith functions since the third pipe has a timing option. We still need to compare the possible derivatives at each point in time. The definite integral is the most suitable way to compare the zenith functions. We want the zenith function with the largest integral, so we compare all of the generated numbers. The largest number in the set is the amount of water in the tub. In economics, it's enjoyment instead of water. Remember, integration produces a number and gives us a rank of a zenith function. This might be a good place to pause if you are unfamiliar with this notation. It's only a matter of neatness. Economic students usually know calculus, but fewer have seen an equation with a word in it. Below the black line, they're all equal to the amount of water in the tub. Now we have four TVs with a common quality rank. People decide if they prefer TV1 in their living room or TVs 2, 3, and 4 spread out in the living room, kitchen, and bedroom. Some people pick TV 1, others will pick 2, 3, and 4. For the Super Bowl, everyone picks one high-quality TV over an infinite number of any inferior TVs, the choice between option A or B in my first video. This is a testable theoretical prediction. In the home, it's between quality or the convenient arrangement of multiple TVs. Individually, no TV is more convenient than another. Convenience is about timing, when you want to play your iPod in the car, according to Duke in the Crutchfield catalog. I can't answer the phone right now is a common voicemail greeting. In 1976, the Quasar VCR was called the Great Time Machine. The DVR example from my first video is pure convenience, since image quality and location are constant. Individually, a DVR with 30 hours of capacity and one tuner has more timing options than a 25-hour one tuner DVR. That makes the 30-hour DVR more convenient. In my first video, I stated that I prefer an infinite number of inconvenient DVRs to one convenient limited DVR. Option D gives me more timing options than option C, which is having only one of the superior DVRs. Option D is the more convenient arrangement because it gives me more zenith functions to choose from. The zeniths produced from C is a proper subset of D. These are testable predictions. 
technical progress leads to an upward shift of the zenith function. But how do we measure these subjective intangibles? Well, the two dimensions here are time and pleasure flow. They rule our lives and tell us what to look for. Pleasure and pain warp time in the human mind. The pleasure from technical advancement will increase the difference between actual time and the way time feels. This truth gives us the intuition. The human body is a network of super accurate clocks. The master clock has been found in the SCN region of the brain. We have a reference point. We're looking for altered circadian rhythms. Electrically, brains are rhythmic at every level. The cell is almost a perfect oscillator, according to Professor Rudolfo Linas of NYU. We will get a linear approximation of the warping phenomenon with a rational choice in a standard utility maximization problem. Utility is a function of consumption, leisure, which is time using goods, and body time, which is eating and sleeping time, the measured circadian activities. The key result is the marginal rate of substitution between leisure and body time is always equal to 1. This will make it easier to measure enhanced leisure since we don't need to look at prices. In the log utility case, the percentage change in enhancement is the difference between the growth rates of leisure and body time. The CES case has a very similar growth formula. 1 minus rho over rho gives us a new coefficient with rho between 0 and 1. Perhaps price data is needed to estimate the unknown value of rho. Economists need a better understanding of the body clock, for sure. The results in Biddle and Hammermesh imply that rho is very small. Scary small, actually. The growth in leisure time over the 20th century is well known by economists. Body time has been ignored. Over the course of the 20th century, sleep gradually fell from 9 hours a night to about 7 hours a night, according to some measures. Eve von Cotter of the University of Chicago presented this series on 60 Minutes and 2020 in front of millions. Eating time has also dropped. Where did the seven-course meal go? Many hours of eating time have shifted to leisure. Imagine more than half of the day eating and sleeping. In Time for Life, Robinson and Godbay summarized the Americans' Use of Time project. Unemployed men and women spent more time eating and sleeping than their employed counterparts in 1965, 75, 85, and 95. That's 16 for 16. This is a striking sample from Robinson and Godbay. Look at the huge increases in leisure time for men. Except for one increase in body time, leisure and body time have gone in opposite directions over the decades. In 95, leisure was at an all-time high and body time was at an all-time low. Amazing since a cross-section at any point in time gives the opposite result based on employment status. We have reproducible results. In experiments, people sleep like they did a century ago when modern technology is absent. Repeat the experiments. Advances in convenience leads to growth in unmeasured leisure. Who saw YouTube vids on their work commute in 1985? Becker and Murphy have linked the skill premium to college attendance. So why are people sleeping less? Sleep improves cognitive performance no matter your views on schooling and human capital. My framework simplifies, unifies, explains, predicts, and measures. In the standard framework, it's a matter of plugging quantities into a utility formula like the Cobb-Douglas. These parametric functional forms are taken seriously enough for calibrated computer simulations. 25 albums on iTunes and 9 on Blu-ray gives me 15 utils if alpha is one half. Can we measure utility? No. Water quality and convenience? Don't ask. So for this equation, the immeasurable equals the uninformative. What about ordinal utility? Well, see my first video and read my challenge questions. 
I can get those indifference curves to do anything that I want because quality and convenience are temporal concepts. If I'm wrong about the framework, then can you intuitively explain why a demand curve would be continuous to a really bright teen? The slope is obvious, but why no jumps? We all know the official American real wage data. It exploded over the first three quarters of the 20th century, and then it froze in 1974. The major absurd implications from the standard model are stagnation in technology and the value of time. Thirdly, the distributional effects of new technology cause this extreme situation for income inequality. My scale destroys these myths because you can't have a shift in time allocation like this if a small sliver of the population got all of the benefits of four decades of technical change. Every living person has 24 hours in the day to schedule, rich and poor alike. Can you name any new products which were introduced after 1974 that is only affordable to the top 1% of American income earners? Memory foam? Microwave fettuccine Alfredo? The internet? Anything? There are a few concepts that try to answer the important question, what is quality? In college, you learn about the income effect, superior, normal, inferior goods. Beyond that, it's quality adjusted units, quality ladders, quality angle curves, hedonic prices, etc. Nothing consistent or coherent. What is quality in school or in the literature? There are a few equations with the undefined Q as a variable. Utility equals quality minus price is my favorite because of its simplicity. But they are all equally useless. After the video, a few wrote about lexicographic preferences, someone mentioned Gödel, and some added fractions of TVs to show that convexity holds. Why aren't there more Blu-ray albums? Good question. There are several thousand Blu-ray videos of all kinds, but only a handful of albums. You can play these albums on the same Blu-ray player and have an exact copy of the master recording in your home. But people just don't seem to be interested. This was addressed in the DVD talk forum. Drexel wrote, Part of the reason is because music has become, for many, a background activity. It's something to listen to passively while out and about, while working, or while surfing the internet. Sound quality takes a back seat to convenience. Drexel has given a good and clear analysis of the market for music because he hasn't been burdened with standard consumer theory. What a disgrace. American wages have had enough time to double since 1974 with 2% growth. They will have had enough time to quadruple by 2024 with 3% growth. Imagine it's 2024. An economics professor that was born after 1990 would have to tell his 21st century students that technology has had no impact on our lives in 50 years, which will be implied by the standard model. Ridiculous! According to one study, the average American looks at some type of screen eight and a half hours a day. In 1948, a fuzzy, wobbly, 20-inch black and white TV was more than $23,000 adjusted with the CPI. You know what you can get today with less than 10% of that price. Sharp revealed a prototype 85-inch 4320p. A 1080p slice of that would be a 21 and a quarter inch computer monitor. I wonder if something better than that will be common in 2024. How will time feel using that screen? If you're a plasma fan and 85 inches is too small, then you should look for the 145 inch Panasonic 4320p. Now it's time to present my theory of quantum gravity. Has it led to a theory of everything? Forget about the manifolds, just use my gravity ladder. In this case, I have the moon, the earth, Saturn, and the sun. Every object fits on my gravity ladder. If I have seen further, it is by standing on giant quality ladders. Seriously, don't forget to visit my website, alexgag.com.